and my doorbell rings and I go to the door and there's a woman standing there with a blue suit and a clipboard and she holds up her badge and she said, uh, I'm with the FBI and I'd like to ask you some questions. And so I said to her, I said, are you here about my Russian husband, Belfast and the Irish Republican Army, my illegal trip to Cuba, uh, the, being recruited by the CIA or being arrested in Nicaragua? And she looked at me up from her clipboard and she goes, uh, well, no, I'm doing a security clearance on your neighbor and I'd like to ask you some <laughs> questions about him. <laughs> She is an intrepid traveler, experimenter, writer, thinker, um, woman of the world. And so it's a great pleasure today to introduce Mary Duncan. Well, tell us about Henry Miller's Under My Bed. But I had a friend, Bradley Smith in La Jolla, and he wrote two books with Henry Miller. When Bradley died in 1997, I think it was, um, his partner uh, became his literary executor. And she called me one day and she said, I have all of these Henry Miller materials, the audio tapes, the photographs, etc. Would you store them for me for two years? I said, sure, be glad to, you know. So she brought them over and we wrapped them in plastic. We slid them under my bed and they were under my bed for two years. So that's how Henry Miller came to be under my bed. You're one of the founders and key supporters of the Shakespeare and Company's extremely successful festival called Festival & Co. How did that come about? Well, how it got started, well, I used to stay at Shakespeare & Company in the 80s. I was a struggling professor. I didn't have a lot of money. And a mutual friend in La Jolla knew George Whitman and wrote me a letter of introduction. And so because of that, I would stay in the writer's room. And so I got to be very familiar with the place, et cetera. And when Sylvia Whitman graduated, this is George Whitman's daughter, 2002 approximately, she said to me one day, you know, I would really like to do a festival, but I'm not getting much support. You know, some of my friends say yes, but other people say no. And I said, well, Sylvia, what's, what's stopping you from doing a festival? And she said, well, you know, there's not even any money for, for posters or stamps. And I just looked at her and I said, Sylvia, I'll give you some money, and I wrote her a check. And, and other people then started contributing. But you know what the moral of this story is? It doesn't take a fortune to get something really brilliant started. You founded a bookshop in Moscow. Uh, about that bookshop, someone wrote, Shakespeare and Company deserves a special mention as a bookstore with a distinct flavor. The flavor of hard-to-find books, freshly ground coffee, and discussions that can transform an unsuspecting customer into a philosophy major in less than an hour. How did you create that? Well, I, I found a partner who had a browsing bookstore. And went for my first interview with him, he had his wife there, and she was a Gertrude Stein scholar. They had been to Shakespeare and Company Paris. And when I told him what I wanted to do, we hit the ground running. He knew exactly that I wanted a browsing bookstore, I wanted a salon. I, he knew exactly what I wanted. And so it was a perfect marriage. And we opened on April Fool's Day in 1996 because everybody said we were fools to do it. Now, a lot of people um, simply assumed that you must have been a CIA agent. Yeah, that's funny. And yes. the FBI even came to you and said, careful, your husband, yes. he's a KGB agent. Yes. What do you make of that? I married my husband in 89. We still had a Cold War. It was still the Soviet Union, you know, so I was breaking ground, so to speak. Um, but yes, the FBI, and because, but I knew the FBI because of my Belfast work. And occasionally they would come to my home and interview me about what was going on with the Irish Republican Army. I ended up working on the playgrounds in Belfast, the Adventure Playgrounds. And I didn't realize that the recreation play leaders were play leaders by day and members of the IRA by night. I was staying in Divis Flats with this, this family and both parents were in prison for terrorist charges. But I maintained a room at the University of Queens and that's where I kept all my notes. Do you plan to write about it? Oh, I've written about it extensively. I mean, I over the years at the university, that was my rise to full professor tenure was the Irish Republican Army, and my world travel was all Irish Republican Army. 
This last year, a San Diego Magazine published an article. The title of it is The World Big Enough for Mary Duncan. Um, it has illustrations. This is an illustration of me taking books into uh, Moscow. And I never paid a dime in duties. I always was able to talk my way through. And then, of course, they had to do one uh, of me as a bunny. I was never a bunny. I never wore the ears. I was always the uh, female intellect around there. I used to enjoy sitting with the bunnies and talking to them about the importance of an education. You asked about the Playboy Mansion, and one of the things that I learned there is that there's a very strong link between the erotic and the intellectual. If you look at Simone de Beauvoir, if you look at Colette, if you look at some of these great women writers, they had thriving sex lives as well as intellectual literary lives. And I think that what's going on in the bedroom is also indicative sometimes of what's going on in the brain. And I think the true intellects understand this. And I think some of your great writers have always understood this. I think I like about Paris is that you can, you can be anything you want. You can reinvent yourself. Uh, you can forget about the world in California and San Diego and you can be in this world. And I find that the writing community here is very inclusive. I really like our Paris Writers Group. We started to ask me about that. That's a reincarnation from San Diego because I belong to the San Diego Writing Women. And over here I realized how much I miss them. And I thought, well, I'll create my own group. So I, and that's how we got started. And I asked individual writers that I knew, would you like to be part of the Paris Writers Group? And they all said yes. And everybody, and it's a nuts and bolts group. We discuss business aspects. We don't do manuscripts. And we're sort of a support group. And I, I personally needed that support group also. And I think the others needed it. If you want to put me 20 years ahead, um, 30 years ahead, perhaps, I have this wonderful photograph of Colette, the writer. And she has a wonderful table across her bed. And she has pillows behind her, and she's sitting there writing. And she's still working at 80 years old, even though she's pretty much bedridden. And I love that spirit of Colette, that even in her elderly years, she's still writing and still working. I think Paris is fantastic, and I, I think there's a wonderful energy here. But I think it's very difficult today to be a struggling writer and still live here. It is not an inexpensive place to live. Paris is very expensive. But it can be done. But you need to have a plan. And I'm a great planner. To our first video interview with Mary Duncan. Ah, oh, thank Cheers. you. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to crack me up. <laughs> oh, God. You can do it Russian style. Okay. Okay, ready? Pedanya. Pedanya. Where's the vodka? Nas vodka. Where's the vodka? Nas vodka. To friendship between the people. <laughs> <laughs>